All right. So today, we'll put it all together and we'll actually solve a couple PDEs on legitimate, albeit simple, domains. So over the last two lectures, we did two things that were complementary and are now ready to be put together. First, we considered the heat equation and then the wave equation on a general domain and used separation of variables to show that the solution can be represented as a sum of terms kind of like this, where there was an exponential decay in the case of a heat equation that multiplied some shape. And that shape was determined by the domain and the boundary conditions. And so then we narrowed our attention down to the simplest possible domain, just a segment from zero to one. And then those Shapes, and by shape I mean just what the profile of the function looks like. The eigenvectors, the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. On the domain from 0 to 1, they just became signs. And not just any signs, specific signs. Signs with essentially an integer series. So I'll explain in a moment where pi came from, and I'll, I'll reconcile some of the things that you see on the Fourier board with this board, but that's the form that we obtained. There were also cosines that we threw out because they didn't, they didn't satisfy our boundary condition of zero. So that should be a little bit suspicious, right? Because when in the last lecture we talk about Fourier series, it was very clear that we needed both sines and cosines. The sines took care of the odd part of the function and the cosines we needed for the even part of the function. So we needed both sines and cosines. But this, excuse me, right here, leaves us with sines alone. So maybe we don't have enough. Okay, so that's one thing we'll clarify. Another thing that's different is that when we're talking about Fourier series, we consider the segment from minus pi to pi. Let me kind of sketch it here. And here we're considering a segment zero from 0 to 1, or from 0 to L. And you might say, well, that's not a big deal, because it's just shifted and rescaled. So we'll just shift and rescale everything. Well, that's actually not going to be quite what we do. We'll do something a little bit different, and I'll just convince you that it's enough. Yes, there will be a little bit of rescaling, but that's all there will be. There won't be any shifting. Okay. So then, just to remind you what the rest of the strategy was, once we separated our variables and realized that in the case of the heat equation it would be ex an exponential decay times a corresponding sign where these ends are the same, and that's very important. And the signs, once again, are the eigenvectors of the Laplace operator with zero boundary conditions. The next step was to say, yes, but the equation is linear, so we can put them together into arbitrary linear combinations. And then calculus kicked in, and we went from our conventional linear combinations to linear combinations, so to speak, with an infinite number of terms. So in other words, infinite series. So this is calculus and linear algebra working together. And I will mention once again, I like thinking about the musical analogy. And it's this particular quantization, I think it's called, uh, of the spectrum that makes stringed instruments and actually all instruments sound the way that they do. The fact that these eigenvalues, or these are the square roots of the eigenvalues, that the frequencies are proportional to natural numbers. You get your base one, which is like this when you play, pluck a guitar, Maybe the most fundamental oscillation kind of looks like this, although this is certainly exaggerated. And then you will see a string going like this, and then, let me do it correctly, like this. And those are the higher overtones, but they all belong to the same integer sequence, which will not be the same thing for the case of a drum, not even a square drum. We will see, we will find that the spectrum is quantized, just like it is here. So there will be discrete values, but they won't be an integer sequence. They'll be something totally different. And that's why drums sound incoherent. 
And even what do you call the uh, like Caribbean instrument? Steel drum. They sound a little bit incoherent, right? So your ear picks out the fundamental frequency of whatever indentation was hit, but then there is, it's a little noisy, isn't it? Well, that's because it's not a linear one-dimensional string. So that's something to keep in mind. So the next step in the strategy was to match the initial conditions. The boundary conditions being zero are kind of already taken care of by the sign. We have to be a little bit careful because when you go to infinity, sometimes things can add up and they won't be zero in the limit. You have to be very careful about saying equals, the whether it's the value of the function or it's limit from the left or from the right. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful. But let's just say, let's save that topic for later. On an intuitive level, the fact that we're using sines and not cosines takes care of the zero boundary conditions. If they weren't zero boundary conditions, if this was the temperature in a room over a course of seven days, right? The sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. I would probably have some periodic and maybe not necessarily, maybe I would state the derivative of u and not u itself. These are called, I never mentioned this term, these are essential boundary conditions, which is when you say what the temperature is, and if you say what the flow of the heat is, then it's called essential boundary conditions, Neumann boundary conditions. So essential, uh, natural versus essential, and Dirichlet versus Neumann boundary conditions. Any, in any case, terminology, we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get there. Okay, so the name of the game was satisfying the initial condition. And what did we do there? We plugged in t equals zero. And we were left with this series that had to match this initial condition. And I chose the initial condition carefully so that the values at the boundaries are zero. So we don't have a mismatch between boundary conditions and initial conditions at the corners. So that's fine. Uh, there could be a mismatch too. Those are very interesting problems as well. We just don't have them with us. So we plugged in t equals zero. And what we realized is that we have this series. So when we plugged in zero, we got what looks like half of a Fourier series. And it must match our initial condition. So at that point we said, we're faced with the problem of decomposing any given function as a sum of sines and no cosines. So we left ourselves with this problem. And then in the last lecture, we kind of addressed this problem, but in a different way, slightly different way. So we have, we'll now reconcile the two somewhat carefully. We looked at a segment from minus pi to pi and took a function that was periodic from minus pi to pi, not necessarily zero at the ends, but just periodic. And that requirement made even the simplest functions not continuous. For example, f of x equals x in the periodic continuation sense became discontinuous. That was fine. And then we decomposed it as a linear combination of sines and cosines. And we kind of concluded that it's possible for just about any reasonable function if you define very carefully what it means to equal, what it means for an infinite series to equal a function. So our conclusion from the last lecture was that any periodic function can be decomposed as an infinite Fourier series, and that was great. Now we have to reconcile the two. How does this finding help us here where we're left only with signs? It seems like we have half the functions. That's number one, and that the machinery would have to be reinvented for this case. Well, we can actually reconcile this and with Fourier series. And here's why it should work on a simple count basis. Yes, in, in every case there's, in either case there's infinitely many functions, but I just want to convince you that it's kind of the same number of infinite functions. Because here we considered sines and cosines that started with having a single period, that was the lowest, let's say cosine, and then half the period, one third the period, 
one quarter the period, in other words, that base frequency, twice the frequency, three times the frequency, four times the frequency, and so forth. But here, if you look at this series, relative to this segment, we're allowing ourselves the signs of half the frequency. Right? If we were solving the same Fourier series problem as we did last time, but on the segment from 0 to 1, the lowest sign that we would allow ourselves would be this one. Right? That would be the lowest frequency sign that we would allow ourselves. But here, we're allowing ourselves this sign. So half, half the frequency. So yes, it's half the functions, but because we're allowing ourselves half the frequency, and then there will be one with three, let's call them half wiggles, it will be three halves frequency. So it's basically the same number of functions. So we're okay. So it's not like we have half the functions. We have the same number of functions. And these functions are nice. I keep repeating it. I keep repeating it because it's the statement that generalizes. What, there are several reasons why we want to stick to these functions. It's not just because they match the boundary conditions, but because it's these functions that are the spectrum of the Laplace operator with zero boundary conditions. Okay, so now let's think through the practical question of using these formulas without, or analogous formulas without having to rederive them from scratch. And it works very simply. So I think you understand where the multiple of pi comes from. The multiple of pi comes from the shrinking of this segment from 0 to pi to going to 0 to 1. So that's easy to imagine. Although we'll think very hard about what happens to this scaling factor. I haven't thought about it. I didn't think about it before the lecture. So we'll think about it together. There will need to be an adjustment there. Okay? But what are we going to do about the left side? Here's what we're going to do. It's just to make this scenario be a special case of this scenario. We'll imagine artificially that we're actually doing it on the segment from pretty good, minus 1 to 1. So we're going from minus 1 to 1. And we're going to continue our initial condition in the anti-symmetric way like this. You see what I did? So now instead of taking just this part and representing it in terms of these signs with half frequencies, we will kind of, uh, is it good enough? It's a little, okay. It, it's hard for me to let it go, but I'll let it go. We'll just pretend it's perfect. We'll now use this larger functions, this anti-symmetric odd function on the segment from minus 1 to 1. And we'll think of this function as being fit to a legitimate Fourier series with sines and cosines on this double period. So whatever was a half wiggle is now a full wiggle. <laughs> Same problem. So we're now back in this scenario. It's just that from going, instead of going from minus pi to pi, we're going from zero, from minus one to one. So we just have to put the right scale, scale, scales of pi in the right place. Okay. And because this is an odd function, there is no a zero and there is no a sub n. In other words, there are no cosines. So it's nice how what we did in last lecture now fits. So there are no cosines there. So there are only signs. So there are only a sub n's, which we're calling here c sub n's. And let's just write down what c sub n is very carefully because remember where this 1 over pi came from. This was the integral of sine with itself. Okay? But now our functions are not sines and cosines. Because we're going from minus 1 to 1, they're now sine n pi x and cosine n pi x. That's where the scale goes. So for sure, we will have this. C sub n will be 1 over something. We're about to discover what it is. 
Okay. And this thing right here is the integral of this function squared. And let me think about it as a, I don't know, on an intuitive level. We're not going to do a proper integral. When it was stretched from minus pi to pi, that integral was pi. But now we're shrinking it by a factor of pi. So the whole picture gets shrunk by a factor of pi. So the area gets smaller by a factor of pi. So I think it's one. Is that why you were going like this? Okay, <laughs> one. That's not what I expected. Very nice. So maybe going from minus one to one actually would yield a slightly cleaner Fourier series. It would move these pi's into the sines and cosines, and then a simple change of variable shows you the equivalent. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So if we had considered that, surely we would have discovered that. Yes, perfect. Yeah, no, of course it is. It's just a rescaling. But the only problem with the rescaling that you have to solve is whether it's 1 over pi or 1 times pi. You just have to put it in the right place. No, see, we don't have to do a shift because we did the symmetric flip. Everything's in the right place right now. We made this new picture a special case, if you allow for rescaling, of the old picture. So there's no shifting anymore. Here's what we did. We said, instead of doing this part, let's do this larger function. And then this would be just the part of the overall thing. That's right. So we're kind of doing it here, but we're ignoring this part. We only added this part to make this a special case of that. OK, so, and so all we're left with is having to evaluate this integral, our integration genie. I was about to call you an integration fairy, and then I thought that would not be right. Our integration genie will tell us what this integral is, accounting for, for the fact that n is an integer. So he won't say cosine n pi or anything like that. He'll just tell me the answer. And it's Wolfram Alpha deserves the credit here. Well, while he's doing that, let me ask you a question. How fast do you think the coefficients will be decaying? That's a great question. Because remember, if the function is discontinuous, they go down as 1 over n. They decay as 1 over n. If it's continuous but its derivative is discontinuous, then 1 over n squared. If its derivative is continuous, 1 over n to the third. And if it's perfectly continuous in the periodic repetition sense, can you even think of a function like that? I'll, I'll show you one. That, that's perfectly periodic. It actually takes a moment to think of something like this, because if you, that's both infinitely periodic, infinitely continuous, but also not trivial, like a, sum of, a finite sum of sines and cosines. So that's a good example. So the coefficients for this function from minus pi to pi would be decaying exponentially. So what, what do you think the case here is? And remember, we're doing this function. So hold on, I'll tell you what I think. So it's obviously continuous. So here's what, what fooled us. I'm, I'm putting myself in that category because I was fooled also. Like this looks perfectly smooth, but it's definitely not. Because if you think about the second derivative, if you go to the second derivative, this is a parabola and this is a parabola. So for this derivative, it'll be a negative constant. And for this derivative, excuse me, for this part of the parabola, it'll be a negative constant. And for this part of the parabola, it'll be a positive constant. So obviously, there'll be a mass is mismatch here. So this point is not as smooth as it looks in chalk. It's a little bit of an optical illusion. It's definitely, there's definitely there something discontinuous there. But I only think it occurs in the second derivative. So I think that the first derivative, the function itself is continuous, and I believe its first derivative is continuous as well, just because when you reflect something, whatever the tangent is, it just stays itself. When you reflect something in the rotation by 180 degree sense, it's, re it's basically reflection with respect to a point.
So the tangent flips 180 degrees and becomes itself. So I say they decay as 1 over n cubed. Was I right? No? See, I don't believe that. Because that would mean that the function is discontinuous. And the function is clearly continuous. So I think it should be, I still maintain, I might be wrong, but I maintain that this should be 1 over n cubed decay, which Jesse was right about. Can I take a look? Oh, no, 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 no. No, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, he, my fault. I take full responsibility. So it's not this integral. That's the mistake. Because this function on the left is not, is not x times 1 minus x. It is its flipped version. It is a different function. So what we should have really done, so it's this integral plus a different integral here. The function here is x times 1 plus x. That's what this is. This is x times 1 minus x. But when we reflected it the way that we did, this portion of it is x times 1 plus x. So what we should have done is integrate this from minus 1 to 0 and this from 0 to 1. And of course, what it will become is twice, where do I put the 2? Twice this integral from 0 to 1. Are you guys with me now? Do you see the mistake that we've made? No, because we're now going after this integral. This is the integral that we need with something here and something slightly different here. And that combined integral is whatever we had here times 2, because whatever we have here is the same thing. Yeah. So this is your new integral. So from 0 to 1 and then multiplied by 2. So I think we can definitely combine them. Yeah. 1 plus this, right? OK. So we have solved the problem. And we can now just actually write down its solution. Let me erase this. And I would say that this is our first non-trivial PDE that was solved from start to finish.